and then we'll have a video for anyone who isn't able to make it. Okay. So like Sue Ann said, feel free to share questions, comments, reactions, uh, and I will do my best to get to those after the talk is, after the talk is over. So um, to start, I'm going to be talking, like I said, a little bit about the mapping project. Uh, first, I'll fill you in on a little bit about what I've been doing in the interim. Like I said, I haven't been to Texas for about a year now, which is the longest I've gone since 2016. Um, I've never missed a Tehenna's homecoming picnic, um, but as we all know, a lot of our usual events have been canceled, as has travel. So I've had to reschedule and push off a few trips down there. Um, that being said, it means a lot to be able to do this and be with y'all today uh, in this capacity, even if it's from such a great distance. So you all probably recognize some of the people on the screen here. Um, this is my amazing crew who was with me in 2018 to help with the Old Dehennis Archaeological Mapping Project. So we were out there in Old Dehennis from November to December 2018. Uh, you can see me here, Trish Markert. Um, and then from left to right, Hunter Crosby, Nolan O'Hara, and Emily Sains. Um, so big thanks to them because this would not have been possible without them. Um, as many of you know as well, if anyone came to my last talk, uh, I did a talk in December of 2018 during the project while we were out there doing all the archeological work. Uh, this project has many different parts. So I did a lot of work in Castorville. I've done a lot of work with historical documentation, scanning old photographs. Um, I've collected oral histories with many of you or folks that you know. Uh, and I'm also working on a museum exhibit for the Beery House um, archaeology materials uh, that might go, it's going to go in the dog trot that's currently under construction. Um, in addition to that, I'm very involved in the lab work for the Beery House Archaeological Project, which is directed by my advisor, Dr. Ruth Van Dyke. So I've been busy with that. There's many different facets to this. Um, today we're going to focus right in on Old Dehennis, because that's the topic of the talk, but I'm happy to answer questions about any of those other um, aspects of the project as well. Uh, I'm currently writing my dissertation, and I've been lucky to have the support of the American Council of Learned Societies. I received a fellowship, so that's going to help me write this by May 2021, when it'll be available to everybody in written form. So stay tuned for that. So just to give you an update on some of the things that I've been working on, we're going to move forward here. Next. Like I said, I've been working hard on the Beery House materials. I know a lot of people would love an update on this, and we're very excited about it. Uh, in particular, I've been working on bottle analysis from the excavations from 2013 uh, well, to 2016 conducted by Dr. Van Dyke. Uh, so here's just a sampling of the bottles that, we've, that I've been looking at. Um, I'm excited about Phil's new news about a whole new cache of bottles, uh, especially because it sounds like they are on the older side. And down on the, I think you can see my cursor, on the left-hand side here, you can see one of those old 19th century bottles. So I suspect it might look similar to this and tell us a little bit more about what was going on in the early days on that property. Um, this isn't the topic of the talk, but I wanted to give everyone an update. Um, in other news, I taught, um, I taught classes at Ithaca College. Uh, I mentioned I've since moved to Oregon and I've become an aunt. So hi to my baby nephew, ne nephew Thomas. But let's go ahead and get into the meat of the talk. Another beep. So the first time I came to Dehennis, one of the things that people like to ask me the most about is what brought me to this project. So I'll talk just a little bit about that. Um, the first time I came to Dehennis, it was because I was working on the Berry House Archaeology Project. Uh, and I drove out and I didn't know much about the town. So the first impression I had was uh, obviously the Main Street, the downtown area along Highway 90, but then I drove out to Old De De Hennis, and of course I saw St. Dominic's Catholic Church, um, this beautiful, impressive stone ruin. It's very striking, and it's close to the hearts of a lot of De Hennis residents. So I was curious, there's clearly a lot of stories here, um, but I didn't know what they were. And so this got me thinking in the early phases of my project as I started formulating what my research would be in this area. So over the next year, I met folks from around Tehennis, from Castroville, from all over Medina County, 
Um, like I said, I've attended the Tehennis homecoming picnic uh, multiple times um, where, you know, I've really just been welcomed and fed um, in all sorts of ways. Uh, and I learned more about both old and new Tehennis. Um, I learned a little bit more about the history of the old town, about the coming of the railroad. Uh, and, you know, I, I was able to talk to so many folks and there's such knowledge. In fact, a lot of you listening, um, you, it's very possible that you still know more about this than I do. So I welcome feedback um, and, and questions and any information you can send my way. But it's been such a great collaboration working with folks from Tehennis and Castroville and the surrounding area. Uh, and as I learned more about the town of Tehennis, I was really interested in learning about how it was organized, right? So not a lot is left on the surface from that original Alsatian settlement. So I was curious, um, you know, what that might have looked like. How did they organize space? How did they decide to build their town upon arrival in this brand new place, Texas? So in Castorville, where, which predates to Hennis by three years, um, the town was organized around St. Louis Catholic Church. So we're all familiar with Castorville. You can see some of the early maps here, um, and it's laid out on a grid. Um, you can see it's in the curve of the Medina River, which was great because that's access to a great water source. It's secure. Um, and you can see here, I'll use my cursor, um, it was organized around a square. So the church is located on Houston Square, and the idea was that it would be a gathering place for, um, you know, for the town, for the residents. And you have Old Highway 90 kind of cutting right through there as well. Uh, and this is reminiscent of a lot of European town plans. You have the church at the center of the community. You have a town square. Everything is laid out very neatly on a grid. So we recognize this. Um, and of course, it's, it's largely how Castroville still looks today. So this is a Google Earth image from, I think, the last couple of years. Uh, and to kind of toggle back and forth, you can see that uh, the town plan is still there with the maybe the most major change of um, new Highway 90 cutting right through right through the town there. So that's probably the biggest change that Castroville has seen in terms of its, its town plan. So this is a great example of early Alsatian organization on the landscape, how people were building their town. So a lot of this had to do with, and this is likely a history that many of you are familiar with, so I'll try to keep it brief, the way colonists were given land um, under their agreement with Henry Castro. So we're familiar with Henry Castro. He was an empresario uh, who was provided a land grant by the Republic of Texas to settle colonists from Europe um, on, his, on his land. And this was a business venture for every person or family that he was able to get to come settle in Texas, he would receive land as well. Uh, and that went variously for him. Um, he had you know, some fortune and some misfortune. I recommend visiting the uh, Castro Colony's Living History Center to learn a little bit more about Henry Castro. Um, but what ended up happening is he would, he essentially promised to anyone who would agree to migrate and settle uh, 320 acres for a single man of land or for a family 640 acres. And when people arrived, uh, the land was largely inaccessible. Uh, this wasn't easy terrain to get through. They weren't used to it. It wasn't easily farmed, um, and it wasn't always safe. There was a lot of conflict in these spaces, particularly with the Apache and the Comanche. So a lot of people ended up stuck in San Antonio. And to mitigate this, Henry Castro actually, out of his own funds, purchased some additional land from the McMullen Grant and ended up um, offering people, in addition to those large land tracts, uh, half acre town lots and 20 acre farming lots just outside the town. So we can see this, I'm gonna go back here, all of these little squares, these are half acres. So these are the town lots that people would have been granted, they would have signed up for them um, and they would have gone and built a log house and then maybe a stone house. And then around the town is where the 20 acre lots would have been. And this again is reminiscent of how people tend to organize towns in Europe. So, we see this in Tehennis as well. So um, really quickly, and again, this is history that most of you know, um, Castro did end up settling four colonies. Um, I'm talking a lot about Tehennis and Castorville today, but we also have Quihi and Vandenberg 
um, which ended up moving because of a water source and becoming New Fountain. Um, so you can see them on this uh, 1879 map of Medina County here, kind of how this is spread out. And I actually believe that, uh, and perhaps someone can correct me on this because I'm speaking off the top of my head, but I think Tehennis is the only colony that was located on Castor's original land. The rest of it was on the purchased land from the McMullen Grant. So uh, they're a little bit spread out and Tehennis is the furthest, furthest west. It's a frontier town um, and it was isolated. It, it went through certain struggles to survive in its early years. So we can see this though in early plots of Tehennis too. So when they laid out Tehennis, uh, you can see these same town plots and farming plots playing out on the landscape. So um, I know this is very difficult to read and I apologize. I'll narrate as best I can and we can go back in and zoom in later if anyone wants to see anything more closely. So this plot is from the 1840s when they were originally laying out to Hennis. You can see here, these are 20 acre lots and you can begin to maybe recognize some of the names that we see here, um, Riber, Finger, um, Bado, et cetera. Uh, and then this here, these are our smaller town plots. Uh, and like Casterville, they're laid out in half acres. So to zoom that in, I know again, it's very difficult to read. You can see here the Parker Creek, we have a water source. Um, here, maybe I can give you a little bit better of a, let's see, this here, there we go, is the church, uh, St. Dominic's, and you can see crosses indicating the cemetery. Um, this here, Right below that, they're uh, designated as school lots. And you can see that family names have been filled in all up and down here. Uh, and in fact, uh, Old Tehennis extends to the north as well, which we'll discuss. So this was one of the first intros that I had to the layout of Old Tehennis. Um, I was looking at this, I could recognize some of the family names. We get a sense of what this town might have looked like. Um, at the time, but we still don't have a sense of where structures are located, what types of buildings they were using as homes, what construction materials they were using. So I was very curious about that. And in order to learn about that, my crew and I essentially went and recorded several of the structures that are still standing in ruined form on the landscape. So I'm going to talk a little bit more about those. Um, first, let me kind of catch up with myself. So one map that many of you might be familiar with from earlier presentations of mine. Is this one here. Oh goodness. I've lost my... Just give me one second. We need to get out of this. Oh, come on. Sorry, everybody. Of course, we're having a technical difficulty. I can't see my cursor. Come on. All right, let's pause for just a minute. Hmm. Oh, there we go. Okay. I want to see. All right, and I'm going to share again. Sorry, that's something that happened earlier. All right, can everybody see? Are we still good? Okay, I'm not gonna do the annotation anymore because it causes my cursor to disappear for some reason. Let's see. All right, so here we are. And um, this blows up to this. So moving on, this might be one map again that you may recognize. Uh, so this is an early map that I made to get a sense of where these plots were located. So what you see here is a Google Earth image uh, and I took this previous image that you see, I made it transparent and I laid it right over top and you can see how closely these fit together. So on the actual landscape, we can see where these town plots were located and what people owned them in the early days of the town. So I know it's difficult to read. I'm happy to provide this image to anyone who's interested in seeing it. But um, again, the church matches up almost closely there. You have roads matching up. And you can see that these blocks are organized in these half acre town lots with the 20 acre lots on the outside. So um, there are one thing I would like to share with you too, and we're going to see if this will work. Um, 
So there's a few other, well, we'll come to that, the Google Earth. There are a few other things that have affected the landscape of Old Tehennis. So one thing that I want to point out is that unlike Castorville, which is kind of the church is at the center and it's in that river bend of the Medina River, uh, Old Tehennis is really organized on a north-south axis. It's, it's long, it stretches um, down south and then up north. It's not really um, clustered together so much as stretched out. And that may be in part because of Parker Creek, um, runs north-south, and so people wanted to maximize their access to water. And you have old Highway 90 eventually running up here. So that's a thoroughfare, um, and that's where you want to put most of your businesses. So it's organizing a little bit differently than Castroville right off the bat, just because of the, the landscape and the terrain and these other factors. There's a few things that also affected uh, the layout of Old Dehennis over time. Um, there's the John James edition. So um, am I frozen or is, I'm good? Okay, I froze for a second. The John James edition, which uh, extends north of Old Highway 90. Uh, and so there's many homes, some of which I visited with you uh, up here north of the highway. Um, and so it continued to stretch out up north and the highway became more of a focal point than St. Dominic's. Um, we also know that Fort Lincoln uh, had a big impact on the town and really its survival in its early days. Um, Fort Lincoln was located to the north and provided a really important lifeline to the early Tehennis uh, community by providing jobs, providing resources, and providing protection. So you can see an old map of Fort Lincoln here. Um, and so that may be another reason that we see Tehennis stretch north, right, towards that, towards that, towards the fort um, and the resources that it provided. And then of course, the biggest impact, the largest event that really affected the landscape and the organization of Tehennis was the construction of the railroad. So uh, in 1881, the Galveston, Harrisburg, and San Antonio Railroad was constructed through the area. We know that it bypassed Castorville, and there's a lot of stories about that that I won't get into right now, but it laid its tracks just outside of Tehennis, about a mile and a half away. And so what we see happening here you have kind of the, you see the stretched out here, the old layout of Dehennis. And then this is a 1915 map. It's the first time new Dehennis shows up on a map. And you can see it right over here, Dehennis with a little circle. And it's now on what has become the Southern Pacific Railroad. Uh, and so old Dehennis here, new Dehennis here, and you have a splitting of the towns. Um, and of course, new Dehennis, uh, it, it looks a little different than old Dehennis, right? Um, this is a plat when they were planning New Dehennis. This is early, it was in 1887, just as they were starting to build some of those structures that you see today. Uh, and you can see it looks different. It looks like a railroad town because that's what it's becoming. You have a long um, main street here. You have uh, places for business fronts. Uh, along that main street, you have plots to the back. Um, and it's all centered around the railroad uh, because that's where all the commerce and the um, people are coming through. So there's already some interesting juxtapositions here. Uh, and one of my favorite stories about sort of the splitting of Tehennis, uh, again, it may be familiar to many of you, is that um, during this time, the annual Tehennis Church picnic continued, but um, St. Dominic's and when they built Holy Cross in the early I believe it was 1914, they began having competing picnics. And so those that were proponents of the old, the old Dehennis, the St. Dominic's picnic, would try to uh, get to people earlier on the railroad as they came in and get them to come to their party instead. So there were a lot of feelings and a lot of uh, contestation about this, but it's what, part of what makes the history of Dehennis so interesting um, and why uh, this research is so, so I think, important. So... Um, there's a few things that aren't clear on this map. Um, this map here is just wonderful, but on the original map, the plat map, we can see which people owned which plots, but we don't see their houses. We don't know how the houses are organized. We don't know where they're located. So that was, again, mainly what I was interested in. Um, and I have to give a shout out to Lily Bolin for finding, with amazing detective skills, this map um, and the report from the National Register of Historic Places from 1976 um, with a, a bid to get Old Dehennis Historic District on the register. 
Um, this map, I believe, was created by Oliver Reinhardt and Josie Finger. But as you can see, it, it lays out where many of the structures were. So the black boxes are historic structures that are still there. The white boxes are non-historic structures. And then if there's a dotted line, um, it's a raised historic structure that we can't see today. So this has been such an invaluable resource. There is a key with the numbers that identifies each of these boxes um, that I'm happy to send around if anyone's interested, but we're just gonna focus on a few today. So these are the ones that we surveyed for the Old Dehennis Archaeological Mapping Project. So um, first we looked at the Joseph Nye House, also known as the Stagecoach Inn. Uh, we then went over to the Peter Cook House, uh, also known as the Pete de Terrace House. Uh, we looked at the Rudinger Complex here, uh, and then we moved down and we looked at the Zercher House um, at, the, at the bottom here. Um, and just to give you a sense, um, this number one here, this is where St. Dominic's is located. Uh, and so this is a good visual reference, but um, what I'd also like to show you is um, the Google Earth, oh, there it is. We're gonna go back to that last slide. Um, you can see some of them here, and I know that they're difficult to see, I think in the interest of time, I won't open my Google Earth. Uh, just, I could zoom in, but maybe after the talk, if anybody would like to see that, I'm happy to do it. Uh, but one of the great things about Google Earth um, that I just realized when I was putting this talk together is every once in a while, they take satellite imagery and update it. And in fact, the last satellite imagery that they took was in December of 2018, just after me and my crew were finished clearing all of these structures um, and making them really visible. So we actually have really beautiful, like precise satellite imagery of these structures because we went through the process of clearing them and the satellite happens to take the photos just afterwards. So that's really exciting. Um, and I'm happy to show people what those look like from an aerial view when we're finished. Uh, but in terms of methods, me and my crew um, used a a couple of different methods to really make sure that we were recording these ruins and these structures well. So the first thing we had to do was clear the ruins. Uh, they were covered in brush, um, trees had fallen, there, were a lot, there was a lot of plant growth. So uh, approaching each one usually took about two days of um, just removing foliage, removing brush, uh, so that we could see them clearly. And my, my crew was absolute champions at this. Then we would map them. Um, we would sketch elevation drawings of the buildings themselves. We would create maps of each of the rooms. Um, we were uh, taking GPS points to create digital maps of the entire space and the, how they related to each other. And we also um, took a lot of photographs. So we photographed artifacts that we found on the surface, um, architectural details in each of the houses, and then the structures as a whole. So I have tens of thousands of photographs of these now, um, which have come in handy in many different ways. Uh, and one of those ways is to make 3D models. So uh, with those thousands of photographs, I'm able to plug them into the computer and make models of um, the houses uh, that we can then kind of manipulate and move through. And I'm going to try to show you an example of this in a couple of slides. So moving forward, we see the Google Earth. What I'm going to do now is I'm going to take you through several of these structures and just give you an overview of some of the things that we've been learning about them, some of the interesting stories, uh, and then I'll talk about some of my next steps and what to expect going forward. Um, structure one is uh, the Joseph Nye House and the Stagecoach Inn. Um, it's a fascinating structure. It has such an interesting history, and it's also one of the largest that we recorded. Uh, it's absolutely massive. So you can actually see here a 1972 photo from the Historic American Building Survey um, of the house. It's since burned down um, because of an accidental fire from a tenant, but uh, you get a sense of what it looked like. It was whitewashed. It had this sloping roof that we're all familiar with. It had a front porch. And actually this area here in the center is a dog trot, but it's been closed in. Uh, but you're able to see that a lot better with our, with our archaeology. So it was run as a stagecoach stop. It had a huge corral for horses. There was a store. It was an inn. Um, and that was during the 19th century. Um, later in the 20th century, it was purchased by Nicolas Rodriguez. And um, I've worked very closely and have to give a big thank you um, to his grandson, Polo Rodriguez, who has uh, allowed me 
um, access to many of these amusing structures over the past few years. So here um, you can see some of the work that we did. This again is that historic photo. And this here is actually what the ruin looks like today. And I was able to capture this by creating that 3D model that I talked about earlier. Uh, so you can see um, the roof is missing. Um, many of the walls are still standing, but are in disrepair. And here you can see that dog trot. So there were two sides to the building. Um, one was a little bit larger than the other, but uh, you can see, um, kind of see the extent of it here. And we'll look a little bit more at that in the next few slides. This is again, one of those 3D models. And one of the great things about this is we can get a bird's eye view of these buildings. Uh, because once we scan them and they create the model, you can zoom up and, and look from above. So this is a, a, just a, a sparse point cloud that we create from the photographs. And I'd actually, I'm going to try this um, at risk of more technical difficulties uh, to show you what this looks like in, um, in my, oops, on my computer. So let's do this, share screen. Uh, no. Okay, share. Oh, sorry. One second. It's cool, so I would like to be able to do it with you. Okay. Uh, meta shape. Here we go. Share screen. All right. Can everybody see the model that I have here? So this is actually structure one. This is the stagecoach stop, and you can see it. You can move it around. Um, and this allows us to see it from above. So some interesting things here, you have the dog trot here, which would have been open um, in its early days, uh, a smaller area over here with a few rooms. Um, there's, I believe, three rooms. Uh, and here you actually have a cellar, which is not common for the structures in Dehennis, but there's a cellar. It would have had large beams and a floor over it with a little um, kind of dumb waiter to bring things up and down. And this was likely the store part of the building. So this just gives you a sense of what this type of model looks like. You can twist it around. You can look at the side. And then this would have been the front of the house as you look at it. It still needs some cleaning up, but I think it gives you a good sense of how big this structure actually is. Um, again, multiple rooms, one, two, three, four, and a cellar. So getting out of that and back to the presentation. Here we go. So photogrammetry has come in handy. Um, this again is a picture of the dog trot. Um, what you can see here too is the really vivid colors of the stone. This is sandstone and when it burns, it turns those colors. So it gives you a sense of the heat um, from the fire that, that took this structure down. Uh, and you know, there are people who remember obviously from the 1980s when this burned and it was on such a cold day that even though the fire department arrived, uh, the, the hoses were frozen and they had no choice but to just let the structure burn to the ground. So it's a huge loss, but we're excited to be able to record some of it now. This is another view here. You can see again how large these walls are. This gives you um, a picture of what would have been the kitchen when it burns. So you actually see a burned oven here uh, and some of that, uh, the plaster that would have been on the walls, which were white. And then one of the most interesting things about the structure is that it was actually constructed in multiple phases, which isn't uncommon, but they use different materials. So here you can actually see a really clear delineation between what was the earlier structure made of sandstone and then an addition that would have become um, the store. And at this point they used large blocks of hewn limestone, which we see you know, in other constructions, uh, including the church. So uh, the fire affected the sandstone and the limestone quite differently. Um, and so you can see that right here. So we get a bit of a sense of the history about this building too. Here are a few sketches that we made. This was a big part of our research was creating these elevation sketches to get a sense of what the, uh, the construction looked like and how the stones fit together and what methods they were using. Uh, and so we have many of these. And this here is one of the oldest photos that we have of it. And you can see here the porch extending. And then over here is that addition, the limestone addition that I mentioned here. 
Um, I don't have a date on this photo, but it was certainly in the 19th century. So um, the stagecoach stop, again, is a fascinating structure with a lot of history, um, and I have a lot more to say about it. But in the interest of time, we're going to move on to structure two, which is the Peter Cook House. So this is up the road and across the street um, on a corner. And uh, again, like the others in most of the stone structures, it was built likely in the 1850s. Um, but this one looked a little bit different. It was a Victorian style house. Uh, by stories that I've heard about it, I've not seen a photograph, though I would love to. But uh, it had three rooms and then a brick addition that came off. So it was L-shaped. And uh, it was apparently a very beautiful house during its day. It had uh, sort of the Victorian front and the um, big windows and many remember it as just a lovely, a lovely house. Um, you can see this brick addition here. Uh, so the building is created of much smaller stones than the stagecoach stop, um, kind of almost rubble that you would find in the creek. And it's stacked um, to create these different walls. It looks like actually the rooms were added in succession rather than built at once, and they were plastered in white. Uh, and then after this was constructed, you have a brick addition that comes out. And again, this would have uh, created an L shape for the house. Um, and these bricks are very interesting. We all know bricks are a huge part of Tehennis' history, but these predate the brick factories um, and they're known as Walworth bricks. So when we look at them, they don't have any markings on them. They're these early bricks that would have been fired in a well uh, rather than in sort of a more modern kiln. Uh, with the later brick operations in Tehennis. So this was an early addition made of brick. Uh, also of brick was the patio. So in fact, let me see if I have another, nope. Um, this whole area here, so this is the addition, was a brick patio. Um, and some folks remember this too. So it was paved completely in brick. We could find it beneath the grass. Uh, and this led all the way out to a well. And one of uh, my favorite stories about this house is uh, from Melvira Carley. Uh, and apparently this well wasn't just for drinking water or wasn't used for drinking water because it had um, some sulfur in it. And so it was actually sought out by residents of the town for its medicinal, um, its medicinal properties. So again, there's many stories, a lot that's interesting about uh, the Peter Cook house. Uh, I also like hearing stories about how um, you know, later generations would often go play in this ruin and were told not to go to the Pete de Terra's house, um, but we'll go anyway. Uh, and so I thank you for sharing those stories with me too. Next, we're gonna look at the Rudinger complex. Um, this includes structures three, four, and five, um, and then also six, which I'm not gonna talk about today, but is the square Rudinger house that's to the north of, of the complex. Um, but this complex we recorded all together. And again, it has many fascinating stories. Uh, there's two stone structures, um, one in front that you can see from the street, one directly behind it. And then behind both of those is a wooden dog trot cabin. Um, these two were likely built in the 1850s, maybe the 1860s. The back building is probably earlier than the front one. Um, but it was home to the whole family of Rudingers. There were actually generations. So the father, um, Rudinger, one of the early settlers, lived in the dog track cabin. His son built the larger house. Um, and so many people have lived in these structures over time, but that's part of the history. They created a complex where all of these houses were actually pretty close together. So this is a photo, again, from 1976, I believe. And you can see this house when it was still intact the stone structure that was behind it, and then over here, the, the dog trot cabin, which is still, again, in, in excellent condition. Um, one of the most interesting things, too, about this um, is this dog trot cabin, because even though it's made of wood, it likely predates almost any other structure that we've looked at. Um, and this is all from stories, but I believe that this might be the earliest structure that's still standing from Dehennis. We have one similar, a little bit smaller, at the Beery R House in Castroville. So this was an early vernacular style that people were using before they had access to stone to build their more permanent homes. Um, and there's some stories too that this may have been used as one of the earliest schools in Tehennis, though we need to learn a bit more about that to confirm. It, it's actually paved with large slabs of sandstone from the bottom of the, the creek. 
So um, one of the other interesting features about this is the huge, magnificent fireplace that's located in the largest building. Um, it's still intact. You can see here a photograph that was taken of it in 72. Uh, this is it today. Um, it looks like it went through some sort of burning event, um, but it has this beautifully carved and decorated mantle. Um, the stone around it is really carefully done. You can see that it had sort of a facade a front to it. Um, and it was likely done by an artisan, maybe somebody who came through town and was offering this type of service. You can see here a sketch that I did of it to record the different types of um, materials and, and uh, strategies that were being used. So um, this is one of the best features of this house and it shows that uh, sort of the care and the attention that people put into building their homes in this early community. Um, you know, you wanna have nice things like a beautiful fireplace and, and a really lovely home. Um, and we can see that here archeologically. So to conclude with the structures, we're gonna look at our last structure, structure seven, um, which is also known as the Zercher House. Uh, this has been a ruin for as long as most people remember. Um, I believe it's been ruined for uh, longer than all of the other ones that we've looked at. Uh, and it's just a beautiful example of the type of um, house that was built in the early days of the settlers uh, in Casterville and in Dehennis. And in, I've seen these in Quihi and Vandenberg as well. So um, it's made of limestone. Uh, it has wooden lintels and door and window frames, which are actually still intact after all these years. And it gives us a really good idea of what this construction looked like. Um, again, it's, it's much more typical of the types of homes that you see in, in Castorville and in Quihi um, than some of the other ones we've looked at so far. So this is the interior of it. You can see that the wood, again, is still very intact and it's just beautifully constructed. You have these large limestone blocks with um, different, or with smaller pieces fit inside. Um, so kind of this rubble construction that this area of Texas is so well known for. And um, it's also very well considered. We noticed that with the windows and the measurements, they're beveled and they're um, all identical down to the centimeter. So whoever built this was a, a real master master builder. Um, one of the interesting things about it is that it's very similar to the construction of St. Dominic's uh, in material and style, and so it's possible that it was constructed around the same time and potentially even by the same person or group of people as the church um, when the stone church was built in 1853, uh, the, early, the early part of the stone church. Um, this is just a short video, kind of a tour around it of that 3D model that I'm going to show you all. So you can get a sense of the main room there and then this small room that comes off the back. Uh, we'll look at an aerial view of that in just a second. Um, and it's really been standing like this for a very long time. Um, it's because of its really excellent construction. It's a strong building with really solid walls. I'm going to stop that there. Oops. So again, you have a large front room here, a small back room here. Um, this actually, if you can see this that I'm outlining with my um, cursor, that is a mantel place for a fireplace, which would have been here, this large missing wall, I believe, was the fireplace, which makes sense. They, they tend to collapse um, if they're compromised. But this also had a really large, beautiful mantel. So that's another interesting, interesting feature that uh, we can't see in person, but that we can begin to think about um, when we look at the structure. This is an example of one of our sketches, and you can see here a close-up of this um, lintel construction, uh, the wood frame, and actually there's notches in the stone for the wood to fit directly into it, um, and you can see we've, we've mapped that out over here as well. So this was to give you a sense of what I've been working on, um, give you sort of a more in-depth view of some of the structures that we looked at, uh, this is still in progress. Like I said, I'm working on my dissertation and I'm gonna be finishing that in May of 2021. Um, in progress right now, I'm creating and polishing up those 3D models that you see of all the different structures, creating fly-throughs. I'd really like to put them online so that you can explore them yourself. Uh, and so I'm looking into ways to do that. Um, I'm using GPS points, photos, and sketches to create maps of Old Dehennis. So I want to create several maps um, there's going to be a nice, beautiful map of everything that we've done and some of the other things, the stories um, and places that are attached to those that I'll be sharing in hopefully the next few months. 
And then I'll be finishing the oral histories and the story maps from the different workshops that we've done together in the time that I've been in Texas. Um, next steps are finish writing my dissertation with the support of my com dissertation completion fellowship, and then hopefully to present final findings um, to you all sometime next year and hopefully in person. So uh, I'll finish by saying thank you to everyone. Thank you to the CCHA for having me for a second time. Um, and then there's just too many people to thank. I could go on for another 45 minutes about that. Um, but I'm happy to take any questions. Uh, thank you so much and for putting up with some of my minor technical difficulties. I think we did pretty well considering the, the circumstances. Okay, thank you, Patricia. That's very, very well done. Thank and, you. Uh, if we could all give you a round of virtual applause, I think it's well deserved. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> Thanks very much. Um, yeah.